Chapter 8, Escaping from the Clutches of a Very, Clever Lady So many people imagine that anyone and everyone who is, engaged in detective or secret service work carries about, with him a large assortment of wigs, false hair, and other, disguises. When any of this work is reproduced on the stage or in moving pictures, or in the pages of works of fiction, disguises of various kinds are generally well to the fore. But, gentle reader, take it from me, who have been through the real thing, and rest assured that any kind of disguise is always attended with danger. To wear false hair or wigs, or even, to have them found in your possession, would mean death, instantaneously, or at best next dawn, in an enemy country, probable imprisonment in a fortress for many years in a neutral one. The cleverest men I have met in the service, rarely assume any artificial disguise, although I admit that, there are exceptional and urgent occasions when its aid must, be sought of necessity. In fiction you will perhaps have observed the universal, rule seems to ordain that the assumer of disguises invariably, endeavors to change his outward appearance from juvenility, to old age. That, to my way of thinking, is merely adding to one's difficulties. In real life it will be found far easier to play the part of a person much younger than you really are, than it is to play the part of one who is much older. Escaping from a very clever lady. On such rare occasions as I had to make it, part of my business to disguise myself I selected for choice the trans dash, figuration off me outward appearance to a younger rather, than an older person whenever the circumstances so permitted. For example, I would enter a building to all, outward appearances a man of sixty years of, age or upwards, and within a very short space, of time reappear as a man of not more, than thirty. These tricks may be attempted at night in. Artificial lights, but by daylight the risks of discovery are not, worth the small gain or advantage that may be believed to be, attained by their aid, the common sailor, or working man who is badly dressed, very dirty in appearance and who has not shaved for many. Days, is generally an object which most men avoid and few, women find the smallest interest in, whilst he can roam at, pleasure in most public places, and if he has the price of a, drink in his pocket he invariably gathers around him a multi. Two of friends ready to tell him anything they may know, or to believe any cock and bull story as to his own antecedents, which force of circumstances or a very vivid imagination, may suggest. All disguises and concealments of identity are of little, avail unless very thoroughly attempted and carried out, Sir Robert Baden-Powell, in his book, My Advent Dash, Tours as a Spy, speaks of the importance of remembering the back view. He writes, The matter of disguise is not so much one of a carrot theatrical, makeup, although this is undoubtedly a useful art, as of, being able to assume a totally different character, change of, voice and mannerisms, especially of gait in walking, and, appearance from behind. A service officer, whether of the army or navy, would have, far greater difficulties to contend with in this respect than, would any ordinary civilian, which is probably one of the, main reasons why service men are avoided when possible. By the German Intelligence Department for Active Executive, work, the face and body are easy to disguise, but the hands are, not. For a rough character rough hands are essential, remember that it is a sure test, when questioning a tramp or hobo before probably wasting one's sympathies as well as, one's substance in trying to help him, to demand and examine a dash, tie-in of his hands. They tell at a glance whether he is a, genuine trier, or merely a chronic waster. 
Therefore, before undertaking to appear as a unit of the working classes, it is advisable to take on a job which will put one's hands into the condition that would appear compatible to one's outward appearance. Unloading or loading bricks into a vessel or a truck is the quickest and surest way of accomplishing this purpose. In a few hours, hands which are unaccustomed to this work will crack up and blister beyond recognition, its continuance for a couple of days will pull the nails out of shape and give the full, true, horny, hardened grip of a genuine son of toil. Want of soap and water will complete a supreme, finish to the seeming ideal, once upon a time there arose an occasion when I had to ship as deckhand and general knockabout on a small Baltic, coasting craft of no classified deaf knit I am. It was rough work, rougher living, and roughest weather. But one soon accused dash, toms oneself to one's surroundings in life, and it really is. Marvelous what a satisfactory cleanup one can make with, the assistance of a little grease and a tiny piece of cotton, waste, the cruise had been completed and the vessel was returned dash, ing to a friendly port when her skipper undertook to ferry a party of ladies and gentlemen across from one small island to another. The deck hand, need I explain that I acted, in that capacity, was indisposed. He sought his bunk, below, only to be sworn at and cursed, and ordered out again. In a manner which unfortunately brought him, under observatian, exactly the opposite to that, which his modest, retiring nature desired, more, particularly so on the occasion in question. One lady, a bright-eyed, vivacious, sweet-faced woman, of between twenty and thirty years of age, remonstrated on, behalf of this seemingly ill-used and unfortunate mortal. And she pleaded with the skipper that the poor man looked frightened and ill. Alas, poor me, dd idle, dirty, good-for-nothing scamp, is the nearest equivalent in English to a translation of his retort. I had been playing up for a discharge, and plead guilty to the indictment. A few days later a fashionable gathering took place. It was held in a beautifully situated house, having extensive grounds, fine gardens, and magnificent views of the surround dash, ing seaboard. Everyone of any local importance was there. Amongst the guests was an Englishman. Five minutes, intercourse with him would have been amply sufficient to have based the conclusion that he was one of those effeminate, lisping, soft, silly slackers, who hang round tea tables and curates meetings, and who have a horror of all things manly, he was dressed in a neat suit of blue serge. Every speck of dust coming to it was at once flicked off with a silk hand gear dash, chief. His trousers were of the permanent turned-up cut, carefully pressed and creased. He sported bright yellow, wash-leather gloves and spent most of his time toying with a rimmed eyeglass. That he was shy, reticent, and retiring was at once obvious, but in spite of a vacuous, faraway look. His eyes seemed to travel over most of the company, and, Whenever any serious conversation took place he appeared, to be wandering aimlessly about, but well within earshot, one lady in the crowd seemed to take a more than ordinary interest in this personage. She was a bright-eyed, vivacious, sweet-faced woman of between twenty and thirty years of age. She was also a clever and far-seeing individual, one, who watches, listens, and observes to advantage. The stranger's face attracted her. She felt somehow that it was familiar. She was sure that she had seen it before, but when or where 
puzzled her, an introduction was an easy matter. Soon she was sipping tea and exchanging views on everyday frivolities with the object which for the moment so attracted her, curiosity. I can assure those who read these lines that the object in question wished himself anywhere but where he was, it is most unusual to meet an Englishman who speaks our language even badly. How is it that you seem to know it so well? She suddenly asked, experience having apparently taught her that questions leading up to the point desired merely forewarned the interrogated. No, no. You flatter me. I'm positively rotten on the grammar. I only know a number of words. You see, I had to learn those because I come to your delightful country so much on business, also for sport, I replied, business. What kind of business, she asked, well, you see, I'm rather interwest in wood and in her wings. Oh yes. And sport. Well, you see, I come here every year for fishing, for some moments the lady maintained an ominous silence, whilst her eyes focused the horizon of some distant islands, lying far out upon the smooth and sunlit sea. She smiled, to herself, as though she had caught a delusive object of, great worth, then, turning her fair head, and she really was, pretty, so that she could look me full in the eyes, she asked. Is it your business or your sport which gives you so? Much fascination for the sea, comma, fascination for the sea. I exclaimed doubtingly, now, Wheelie you are quite wrong. I never go on the sea. Now, Wheelie you are quite wrong. I never go on the sea, unless I'm Wheelie forced to do so. In fact, I hate it. It's, so beastly restless when it might be quiet and let everybody else be quiet too. I lisped painfully, I think you said it was herrings that interested you. She replied, following up a point she seemed determined to push home. Are you sure it's not a larger species of fish, comma, yes, quite sure, I hasten to add. I have no interwests in your extensive cod fisheries, nor in the oil, which I am told is such good business, I did not mean codfish, she said. I meant a much larger sort of fish, a big fish closely related to the whale. 